Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Ruan. I've um, always known that uh, the 90% will uh, be a sort of a pay it forward. So um, <clears throat> this morning, it's lovely to share with an audience whose hearts are open and and ready to see whether they can be uh, of value in, in the kingdom. And to be able to share here is just a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. So <clears throat> thank you very much for that. Um, I've got a few ideas and a few things I would like to share, and I think... Um, you know, in the build-up to today, I felt that there's a couple of things that, you know, I would like to share in a moment like this, speaking about calling and speaking about our work in the, in the marketplace, so to speak. Um, but last night, I felt like, you know, there was a redirection in what needs to be shared this morning. So in a few minutes, I'm going to just um, also focus it towards the life of Moses, because I think that's something that has helped me tremendously in working out this making sense in this rationale of where you are in business, in life, in calling, in career, and where it is you aspire to and, and are inspired to, to achieve some sort of an impact or significance in the kingdom. And um, so straight out of varsity, I felt like, you know, I want to make a difference. So just prior to receiving my um, degree, which took a while, I might add, um, we had the saying on, on Turkey's campus that... Um, your your studies is not a is it's a but no, no it's a, it's a it's a career not a racetrack you know so you you try and make the most out of it and um, in the end I got married during my time at varsity to a most beautiful wife and still is after 20 years this year in 2020 we married for 20 years with four beautiful children and during that time I felt you know the Lord you know saved me out of a very interesting life as we all have the testimony for and in my final year I of, of studies then I got married and then wanted this to make sense now I'm called into a new life and it's sort of the old life that I felt like I wanted to you know have a strong career and I watched a lot of LA law on TV and I thought you know I can speak to people I love to engage with people so maybe maybe law is is the calling and the purpose for me and then I got to the Lord and it felt like, you know, the carpet was swept under my feet of, you know, how does this make sense now? You know, how, how will I be able to defend people? I don't believe in the cause that, you know, they should be innocent. You know, how, all these things, how, how does it make sense? And so at one particular moment um, in church, as I was wrapping up my studies, I think actually at that time I was doing my articles. I fell, um, I had received during, during this church service, I received a prophecy and, and the, the, the minister spoke and said, you know, the Lord made you to study law. And I thought to myself, and I can remember it very clearly. I honestly f thought to myself, no, you got it wrong because I did this to impress my girlfriend at school. <laughs> who's both, both of her parents were, you know, were um, legal people. So, so I felt like, okay, where does this go now? Um, and so, but I kept that in heart. And during that time, I started to develop a passion for ministry. So, so we were ministering on campus. We had small church services weekly on campus where at times we were 60, 70 people. At other times, you know, if the message didn't go that well, the next, next week we were five or six people. And then it grew again to 20 or 30. And that went on for five years. And that made me to... Um, to think about and ponder about, you know, what really is the, the calling of the Lord? Because during week times, I'm running practice and I'm trying my best to become a good attorney. And during weekends, I'm having, you know, breakaways similar to this where we try and get people to live out their calling for Jesus. So that started to become a conflict. A conflict on the one hand, you know, the passion for the kingdom. On the other hand, somehow building a career. Um, during the week, I remember during that time in the week, I spoke to one of the uh, uh, potential client, walked up to me and he said, you know, he wanted me to, to help him um, structure a, a loan agreement for his clients. He, he was into sort of a, a credit loan facility that he provided to clients. And he came up to me and said he wanted to do at a certain interest, interest rate of 20 to 30 uh, percent um, on, on the capital that was loaned. Um, and I said, yes, but that, I don't even think that's legal. Back then it was still the Usury Act. So I said, I, 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 let me look into this. But um, certainly under the new credit act, that wouldn't have been legal. But, but back then I had some research to do. But I told him, listen, I don't think this is legal. And he said, 
in that case, I'll confine myself to the underground. <laughs> and I thought to myself, now this is really the thing. On the one hand, I'm involved in discussions like this where people want to confine their own lives to the underground. On the other side, at weekends, I'm like, you know, trying to build the kingdom. And in that tension and conflict, God, I believe, was starting to work a work that he wanted to integrate my career and calling into something that has there's unity, that I can wake up in the morning and I can say, with what I'm doing today, I'm extending the kingdom. And hopefully I'm still doing that today. I thought of that prayer that David prays in the Psalms. Um, he says, Unify my, uh, unite my heart, O God, that I might fear you. And constantly I think about that if you know, some of the transactions we do in Nikka Capital and, and raising of capital and, and all of that, it, it draws you into a space of financial, um, you know, knowledge and, and working with financial advice. And then suddenly, you, you, at the end of it, you start to ask yourself a question again. How does this relate to kingdom? Lord, draw me back so that my heart is united with your kingdom purposes, with what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis um, in what might be called the secular world, but really there's no difference between, there's no, no separation between the kingdom and the world out there. It's all one because in Jesus, if he unites our heart and unites our day-to-day -day experiences, then we start to live out kingdom. And for me, in looking at um, the life of Moses, I've, I've often felt like, yes, there's something going in this man's life that I can really have a, have a take out from. Boom, there we go. That when I journey with Moses through his life, I see very interesting things. And the first thing, before I get to Moses' mistake, the first thing is that Moses' life seems to be in seasons of 40. So the first 40 years in the palace, so I can just imagine he, he had all the Egyptian economics 101. He had the literacy. He studied the classics of Egyptian, the Egyptian empire. He did all that during his time in the palace, so that he was really astute and really well-trained in, in all the knowledge that the Egyptian system could offer him during that time. Um, up to a point um, where something changed and there was this significant life-impacting moment that it shifted for Moses into a season, a next season of 40 years, which it seems most of that 40 years was spent in the desert in preparation for his which we often think of as his final 40 years, but really we all know that there's no final 40 years because we live for eternity. So, so that last phase, that last season was really in preparation for something else. And it also was in preparation for those who came after him, the generation of Israelites that had to inherit the promised land. So really all of his life was a journey of setting a, a, a process up for the next season that would and should follow um, and for me that's calling because I think the the difficulty for all of us sitting in years when we think of our calling as a destination that we arrive to I'm um, spending some time in the church world initially trying to figure out this divide between business and and church I also made myself available for full-time ministry for a season and as I landed in this particular church Guess what they gave me? I needed to develop a program for leadership development and entrepreneurs development. And I'm like, yes, I'm trying to get away from that. But here I am once again in the middle of ministry now doing that other thing that, I'm believe, that I believe I'm, I'm called to do. And so for me, calling is not a destination. It's not a, a place where you arrive to. For me, it's a process of preparation for God's eternal purposes to unfold in me and, and your life. Um, and I think that's critical for us. Um, Psalms 84 says that blessed is the man whose heart is on a pilgrimage, whose heart is set on his ways, on Zion. And so that pilgrimage is that process and that path of your calling of every day seeking the Lord in the midst of what I do now. And I see that in Moses' life. Actually, the one time he missed it was for something that came after him. So it was also in preparation of, of, of what should come, come after him. Um, I just want to mention this quickly before I mention the seven things I see in Moses' life. Um, as a young boy, my mother often told me this or shared this picture with me that um, there's this one guy sitting by the fireplace and then there's this train moving by. He's in the, next to the fireplace in the middle of a cold winter in the vast open. Um, you know, somewhere, let's make it the Karoo. 
And so the, the train passes by, and as the train passes by, he sees someone in the middle of the train on his journey. And as he sits next to the fireplace and seeing this guy passing by in the, in the train, he says, oh, how wonderful it would have been if I was in the train. The guy sitting in the train sees this guy by the fireplace and thinks to himself, how wonderful it would have been for me to sit next to that fireplace where that guy is sitting. And that kind of set in my, in my mind a, a, a thing of how much we desire the destiny in se- instead of setting our heart on this pilgrimage, this process of how the Lord is constantly developing us and that becomes the path of fulfilling His calling. Because in the end, really, our calling is when when we arrive at the master's feet. That, that's that's the, all of our shared calling. But our processes differ in how we're going to lay down our crowns in front of the master's feet. Um, some of us in traditional ministry, some of us in pulpit ministry, some of us evangelists, but some of us definitely in the workplace, in the marketplace, in legal industries, in, in the financial world or where it may be. So Moses' life helped me really with that. that um, the first thing I see in his life, I see... In his life-defining moment, that process of calling really is, is as you look back in your life, you can see stepping stones of life-defining moments in your life that God aligns you with the calling and purposes that he has for you. And, and Moses' first one, I would say, or one of the big ones initially, is his mistake. That Moses had the calling to deliver Israel from Egypt. We can see it retrospectively. And looking back over his life, it's clearly what, what the Lord wanted him to do and to be in this, on this earth. So, so, but there might have been something in Moses' heart that he knew that redemptive ability that he had or that redemptive calling that he was carrying. So the moment he saw something challenging that or, or, or his fellow Hebrews in distress, he reacted to that calling, which I believe wasn't in the Lord's timing. So, his first mistake was to preempt what it is the Lord wanted to do. To preempt that the Lord called me to do this. To try out of the flesh and out of self to make something work because he believed he was called to redeem the Hebrews, the Israelites. And I think many times in my life that has happened, and it's certainly one of my mistakes, but I can think yours as well, that you, you feel like the Lord has called me to set up businesses. The Lord has called me as an entrepreneur. The Lord has called me to give good advice and, and be in corporate development or what the case may be. But, but the season and the timing and the release from the Holy Spirit hasn't arrived in your life. So it's almost as like you want to force it. And in that, there's tremendous struggle and there's tremendous tension that takes place in that. And for me, I think it was that, that season of, of trying to plant a church in Pretoria. Um, I remember we during that ministry moment, as a student, um, weekly events, we really had this vision of planting a church on the, on the campus of Pretoria, University of Pretoria. And, and one night, a, a prophet, a prophetic person, called me and said, listen, that church that you want to build, I'm praying against that. And that's not what you want to hear from a prophet. You know? <laughs> it's not like, you know, because the Lord has called you for something else, and, and I want you to see that. And it wasn't long after that that I received a, a call out of the blue, really. I was actually ministering at a conference at one of the, one of the churches in Pretoria. And one of the attorneys um, attending that conference, and that doesn't happen often that attorneys firstly attend church. <laughs> Secondly, that they approach the pastor or the preacher afterwards and says, listen, I need a, I need a colleague. Would you come and, come and work with me? And, and that really set me up on the tone of where I'm still today, where where we started to get involved in company structuring, work for one of the big four banks in a, in a division in that bank, reporting to the MD on, on how to set up, back then it was still very new, black economic structures, black economic empowerment structures, and, and, and be involved in that. And it was just a couple of weeks after I decided, but you know, I know the Lord has called me into a new season. And that preemptive mistake really could have diverted me or extended the time I believe, for the Lord to, to do what, what he planned um, in my life. So in each of these seven defining moments of Moses, I want to ask you a question. And, and the question in this one is, what is your, or what would you identify as your own calling mistake? Where you believe you have an unction from the Lord or instruction from the Lord. What is it in your makeup, your buildup, that you feel misdirects you? 
of what the Lord has in mind or extends or procrastinates what the Lord wants to do in your life. And maybe that's just something that you might want to look into and, and maybe have a question on. The second one that, um, that I pick up from the life of Moses is where is the, where is the place that you stand now? As, as Moses received his, his uh, life-changing call from the Lord in the, in the fire, the fire was, as you know, the story in Exodus 4, 3 or 4, that speaks of, of God speaking out of the bush, the burning bush, spoke to him and he says, um, do not come closer because where you stand now and, and you know, take off your sandals because where you stand now, the, that place is holy ground. And um, for me, that idea is, I believe every place that we tread upon is to a certain degree holy. Because God is the maker of, this, of all of this. God has made everything that we see, feel, touch, own, want to own. You know, all these things. God is the owner of the cattle of a, on a, upon a thousand hills. And so, so here's the thing that when God says the place where you stand is holy, I believe Everyone knows we're standing on holy ground, but not everyone realizes and think about it long enough to take off their shoes. Everything we have and see is the Lord's, but, but there's a response. And it's interesting that Moses was curious to see what this is. And as he approached it, he started to hear the voice of the Lord speak to him. And I think for me, that's, that's the key. In our everyday life of engineering, of whatever it is that we do day to day, to realize what I'm doing now, I'm doing as if for the Lord. That makes it holy. So that really breaks down a barrier and a divide of the secular and the sacred because everything that these hands touch must be able to be as an offering to the Lord. And Moses stood there and he said, the place where you stand now is holy ground. When we have that realization, I think so many things will change. Just recently I visited... Uh, a friend of ours in Nika Capital in Kansas City. And uh, he has a prison ministry. Well, not really a prison ministry, really a prison business. So what he does is he manufactures these car seats uh, or, or lawnmower seats really for, for companies like John Deere and others um, where the prison inmates, and they're in a top security prison, um, C-Max, uh, most of them are there for 20 years plus, um, they, if they show certain behavior just before they receive parole, they are actually granted permission to, on the prison premises, be able to manufacture these car seats. So he has absolutely no problem with labor. Everyone wants to work. Everyone wants to work long hours. They, I mean, they're just the most wonderful people to be around with. They've got the best attitudes at work. And it's just amazing to, to see how they function. And I spoke to him afterwards, or as a, as a group, we wanted to find out how did, we, how do, how did he get to it? Because one of my colleagues said, you know, can't we do this in South Africa? I said, no, 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 no. I don't think we're really ready for this. Because you can really see kingdom operating there. And, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, going through all the hoops of correctional services trying to get this approved. So I said, I don't think it's possible, but maybe it is. Maybe I was just being negative. And we asked him and said, listen, how did you get to this awesome kingdom building transformative project that you are doing in C-Max prison to give people value back, dignity back, to be able to work for a life, receive an income. They're not getting paid, but they have this endowment that after 20 years receiving, I think, $120 a, a, a week are being paid into an account. So when they get, are, are released after, uh, after 20 years being incarcerated, they have this endowment. He said, you know, John... I was just looking on ways to cut on labor cost. And I, I thought, man, that, that's, that's amazing. That's just walking the path. And as you do what you believe you are called to do, the Lord opens up these curtains for amazing kingdom impact. And he was just doing what he does well, and, and that is business. So, so for me, the place we are standing, where you stand now is the place that we are called to. Um, I often think of Madiba in this sense. Um, and if, if Nelson Mandela lived five decades later than when he did, he might have been a great lawyer himself, uh, you know, a partner at Edward Nathan Sonnenberg in Santon, maybe a judge on the bench, and maybe we would have heard great things of him. But we, if he's five generations later than where he was 
in his now, I don't think that kingdom impact would have realized to such an extent. So where we are now, in a sense, sus, in a sense susses the, the kingdom impact out of us. What I mean with that is the business that you're involved with and the frustrations you go through, whatever has been placed from the Lord in you through his calling is being released in the now. It's not being released in when you are preaching in 15 years. It's being released where you are right now. And I think that's where the, where the impact might lie. And I had this experience just recently. I was um, for Nika Capital. We raise money to um, buy and develop Christian schools. And so we're building a balance sheet for that. And on the other side, we're giving away a lot of revenue. So in the beginning of the year, it looks like we're doing well. At the end of the year, we <laughs> fly around the world trying to, trying to get the help to, to keep on doing what we're supposed to do. But so that brought me to a place in, K, in the Cape province, in Western Cape, called Bonnyvale. And some of you might have seen this in the, in the news and in the press, where two, one farmer, an, uh, an engineer, and an actuary decided they needed to do something about the, um, the education environment in Bonnyvale. So the engineer donated his wine farm into a non-profit. The actuary donated his time, which is more or less the same value, I suppose. <laughs> he donated his time into this, and they started a school. They raised 70 to 80 million rand, as I understand, on capital to build a flagship school in that area, to make an impact, to start praying with the community to see what the community realizes needs to happen there. And a year or two into the story, they have, I think, 200, 300 kids from the street in the township attending free schooling in that, in that area with, um, with also um, receiving not only the grade 12 certificate, they'll also be able to receive trade certificates that they are able to to do ironing and woodwork and, and material work and that. So, so and that, that comes from a professional environment, adding that value, building that balance sheet, being able to raise the capital to make a real big difference. So the word was, tell, my, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And that, that makes me to understand that the place where I'm now realizes the call of God in my life. It susses out the place I'm called to a certain influence in certain people's lives that is really important um, i actually jumped to the to the next one there um, so the second question on um, point number two is who is the people that you need to go to is it the factory workers is it the the legal industry or something i've picked up in, in all these industries and working cross industry is that everyone think that you know from a church point of view if i can mention that everyone think that industry is the toughest and hardest to crack for the lord and for the kingdom the construction folk says, listen, these people can drink a lot. You won't be able to share a message of good news here. The lawyers think they are really the tough guys. The, you know, and everyone has got their own giant to face. But I believe that if we are there, there are people that we are called to, and you have the message to do that. You have the time and the opportunity um, where you are called to. So, so who is the people you need to go to? And then the third point there that that Moses had to encounter in his life-defining moment is tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So the place where you now is holy ground. I often, often think of a story of William Wilberforce. Has any one of you heard that story? So William Wilberforce was actually the British guy that was, oh, I believe, carried a call to abolish the slave trade in the 1700s, 1700, late 1700s, I, I think. So what happened was he, he went to a guy by the name of John Newton. So John Newton himself worked as a slave trader on one of these ships, exporting people from Africa mostly to, to the States and, and to the Western Hemisphere. John Newton, by the way, wrote the song um, uh, about what? Amazing Grace. <laughs> so he wrote Amazing Grace, and as he wrote that song, uh, William Wilberforce approached him and said, listen, I want you to disciple me. I want to become a minister of the gospel. And as he wanted to become a minister, John Newton spoke to him and he says, please don't become a minister. There are too many of us. And, and amazingly what happened is he took those words as from the Lord and he, and he turned around and he went and became a very influential politician 
which through his way of doing politics, I think they also called him some sort of a bulldog like they did um, with Winston Churchill. He was able to labor a policy so that the slave trade was abolished. And, and really, the abolishment now is accredited to his work to a large extent of making a big impact so that we have, you know, that, that is freedom um, today. Um, the question there I want to ask is, what is your now as we go into the fourth one then? The fourth one is, in identifying our calling, is what is, what is your unquench, unquenchable flame? It's amazing that as Moses approached the flame, I was curious to know what it is. The Bible says that the fire burned, but it wasn't quenched. It didn't stop burning. It just kept on burning. I believe I'm speaking to a group here, and you have that inspiration, that inspirational moment from the Lord that you know you're called to a specific area, specific task, specific thing. I didn't mention this, but as I left that school at Bonnyvale, I drove back to the airport in Cape Town, and in the car I felt like, because just the previous weekend, we had this discussions of some of our friends emigrating to, to Australia and wanting to emigrate. And as I was in the car, I felt like if I was in Australia now and I wanted to make an impact in influencing the educational sector, I would have felt I needed to, to come back to South Africa and in the process lost a lot of money. Because I felt there's a little bit of capital here that we have access to. There's a lot of friends that we have here. There is knowledge that's applicable to the South African context, which wouldn't apply necessarily to, to Australia. There's a lot of resources that we have here to impact society here. So why, do, why is it that I want to go somewhere else? And it felt like that, that this very aspect of, of that inspirational moment that I approached the flame that, that the Lord started to motivate and inspire me to make a difference and a change in the setting where I am. To make the difference there and not somewhere else. I think the Bible, when the Bible says the calling um, and the gifts of God is without repentance, I believe some of you might sit here and feel like maybe I've lost it. Maybe that motivation and inspiration is gone because I've done uh, that big mistake or I missed something and I'm going to do this course here and now I need to work it out here. But the Bible says it's without repentance. Therefore, I've seen in my own life where I have these seasons of just recognizing that it's been here all along. And, and I believe it's from the Lord that it would always be there. I believe even that it's passed down in generations. Um, I didn't think of mentioning this, but, but my, I find myself very much in the educational thinking brain trust environment now and thinking how to structurally, structurally change education, the education landscape in South Africa now. And, and my great-grandfather was involved in the planting of, of one of the big pu public universities. Never knew him. His, his son-in-law, my grandfather was, you know, school principal and all these things. And I even have one of my school friends here that would testify that school wasn't necessarily Something that I enjoyed that much. So after a few years, this calling, this flame, this inquenchable fire re-emerges because it's there from the Lord. And, and I really believe you have that. And it's to get that moment of inspiration where, where Exodus 3 verse 4 starts off to, or, or says, the Lord spoke out of the flame, Moses, Moses. That you can refresh that during these two days of hearing Stefan, Stefan, of hearing Alex, Alex, of hearing Karen, Karen. All right, so the question, what's your driving passion and the inspiration that cannot be quenched in your life? What is it that you can identify? What is that thing that, that draws you? I, I believe mine is to, 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 to develop people and to inspire people to that, that kingdom building. Just recently, I spoke to Steve just now. Uh, we went to Mexico to go to take a flight from Atlanta to Kansas, then from Kansas to Mexico City to Villa Hermosa in the south. Now, those of you who follow CNN, that's the place where El Chapo need, uh, had, you know, had most of his activities. So in the backyard of El Chapo, there's a 3D housing printing community. So they print houses through 3D printers. And we thought that can change the educational landscape in South Africa. If we can print school buildings, at least I can tell my kids what I do every day. You know? <laughs> and so it becomes easy. 
So there was this moment of inspiration, but immediately I had to direct it back to what I think that inspiration and calling and motivation of the Lord in my, in my heart is, which is to develop people, in this case, in an educational environment. The fifth one, unquenchable flame, is the fourth one. And the question on the flame is, what's your driving passion and the inspiration that cannot be quenched? The fifth one is, um, at one particular moment, Moses led the Israelites out of, uh, through the Red Sea, out of Egypt. They were now moving towards the promised land. And then at a point, they ran into difficulty and, and had these enemies they had to encounter. And at a point, l- the Lord became angry at them. And he said that, you know, he's going to you know, just wipe them all out. And the interesting thing that happened there is Moses, as the leader, started to talk back to the Lord um, And in this dialogue, he said, but what if you do that? What if you wipe them out? Then they would start to think, the Lord brought them out of Egypt just to kill them in the desert. And and then Moses said, what what would that mean to your name? And for me in understanding my calling, I often need to realign it to ask this question, for whose reputation is this? Am I building kingdom? Am I setting up Nika Capital and leading the board and, and doing all these things for John Jones's name? Because if I do, it's really of no value. Although I don't like to think of it that way very often. But I need to realign to say, is this for my fame or for his fame? Is it for my reputation or is it for his reputation? And I think it's incredibly important for our Christian vocation and our Christian calling because very often you can have your skills and your abilities and your talents direct you in a way that if you look carefully, you're really not building his kingdom. You're really setting it up for your own security and your own comfort and your own you know, <clears throat> kingdom or, or, or life and career that you are developing and building. So that question becomes clear to realign me with, with, his, killing, uh, with his calling. Someone once say, said that the primary call of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So all of us need to come back to that primary call in whatever it is that we do, whether it's business, whether it's ministry, whatever the place is where we're functioning, that we live for the glory of God and we enjoy Him forever. If you think of it, there's no way you can mess that up if you do it for the glory of the Lord. Because if I can really present myself for the glory of the Lord in any transaction, then the promise is that God makes everything to work together for good for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. So he's going to work it out. But my heart is aligned to build his kingdom and, and follow his purposes. I just want to mention this also. It, I, I read this once that it is amazing to, to see what can get done if we don't worry about who gets the credit. Have you ever thought about that? Now, I want to add something to that and rephrase it. It's amazing what can get done if we only make sure that God gets the credit. That it's not about you, not about me, but we allow him to take over and invigorize the, 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 the project and the purposes. So there the question is, are you resisting fame in the selfie age? Is God at work in your, in your plans and what you are setting up in your family, in your business? So in the selfie age, everything is about me. So are you making a conscious effort to resist that fame and to resist that ego-building opportunities that ever so often arises so that you can make sure that you are building his kingdom in what you do? Two more. So (laughs) that was actually his reputation. The first one there is Jethro's advice. So when, when you are faced with, uh, with burnout, here's the question, is in developing and searching and seeking for your call in the Lord, are you looking at this place of also setting up structures and systems for support? I think in Moses' life, that was a life-defining moment because he was facing burnout. And I'm wondering how many people in business, in ministry, in NPO management, whatever industry or, or space you represent here, how many of us function at the at, at, at the rate that we should function and we are withheld from that realizing our calling just because we are basically burnt out. And I heard this recently that, you know, if we, if we, if we don't realize, I think Timothy Keller says this, that it's not, the, it's not the alcoholism that gets people into trouble. It's the not acknowledging that they have a problem with alcohol that gets them into trouble. 
And I think in burnout, it's the same thing. It's not... It's the fact that we don't realize and acknowledge that we're struggling with this, that we live in an age where it's really a, it's a prestige thing to say I'm too busy. And how biblical is that? How Christian is that? And so Jethro's advice is really it's not good that you try and attend to everyone's need. Set people up in 20s and 50s and 100s and help them to give people the advice that you want to give every, everyone to. And, and I believe that's advice for, for some, of it, some, some of you here. Yeah. And the question there is, why are you demotivated and burnt out? Well, first question is, are you demotivated and burnt out? The, the, the why with that is the second question. Why are you demotivated and burnt out? Why don't, I, why don't you have that release and fire and passion that you used to? Have? And then the very last one, life-defining moment in the life of Moses, that's really my favorite one, is what is it that's in your hand? For me, that's the key in breaking this divide between secular and sacred is to answer the second question that all of us need to answer one day in heaven. The first one is, what did we do with his son, Jesus? The second question is, what did we do with what he's given us in our hands? And that really comes down to, what is that authority that you carry? Some of, it, some of you are team leaders. Some of you are business leaders. Some of you... Carry in your hands the authority to lead a nonprofit, and And that's the real question of what is it that you have in your hands? For Moses, before the Red Sea or in front of the Red Sea, death was in front of him. The advancing armies of the Egyptians was behind him. And he said, Lord, what do we do now? So it's cool to suck in front of him. It's cool to suck behind him. And the Lord said, listen, just raise your hand. And in his hand, he had a staff. And some of you might not know this, but on a shepherd's staff that Moses was in that middle 40 years of his preparation, on a shepherd's staff in ancient Israel, they used to carve in their testimonies. So if they, you know, won a bear over or beat a bear or whatever the case may be, they will inscribe that on that rod. So when Moses lifted his rod, he was basically saying, the same God that had me beat that lion... The same God that took me through facing the bear, that same God, that testimony is able to carry me through this. And the Bible says the moment he lifted up his rod, the Red Sea split. And what that means for me in me and your calling is that sometimes you need to go look back and see how the Lord has set up stepping stones in this process, decades over decades, years over years, to align you for where he's taking you, to give you that vision of where he's going with you, to see what the authority is that you carry. Ironically enough, in this, this whole message, when my son was born, um, he was uh, born still. So, so after the doctor, someone that the Lord used in her ministry, being a nurse, called out the name of Jesus five times over his life, he started to breathe again with severe brain damage. And after this entire process, or during this entire process, he had a different name. And in that time, we felt that the Lord was speaking that his name needed to change, to change and we changed his name to Gustav, not knowing what it meant. And so when we changed his name to Gustav, I called up a friend and said, listen, what does Gustav mean? She said, okay, this, this is what she researched, and it means the staff of God. Meaning that in that very moment that we called on the Lord, the Lord intervened and placed us right on track with where he went with us as a family and where he, where he was going with us through his staff upon us. And this is my prayer in wrapping this up. This is my prayer for you that, that calling is a deep spiritual journey that you need to work out in the processes unfolding in your everyday life. But through these lessons that I've seen in Moses' life, I believe those lessons helped me to not only accept but to live and realize the call of God in my everyday life, that I needn't be in a spiritual space to live it out, that I can really live out that in the everyday out there, that the circumstances need, to change, need, need not change to accommodate the calling of God, but the calling eventually is going to change the circumstances out there. Amen. So, um,